الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المحتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Wa alaikum assalam. One day a companion of the Prophet ﷺ went to the Masjid al Nabawi and he saw the Prophet ﷺ leave the mosque. So he followed the Prophet. And he saw the Prophet ﷺ going towards a garden of date trees, I guess the English translation says palm grove. And then he sees the Prophet ﷺ stop. And then after a minute or two, the Prophet ﷺ falls down in sujood and he is prostrating himself and the sahabi is watching him and Rasulullah is in prostration and he remains in such a in the state of sujood for such a long time that the companion fears that perhaps the Prophet ﷺ has left this world it is for such a long time that the Prophet of Allah is in prostration that his companion fears that he has left his world and he goes to him and tries to touch him in waking. <coughs> Rasulullah looks up and says, what can I do for you? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I saw you in Sajta for so long I thought you had left us. He said, when I came here into the garden I met Jibril. Allah. And Jibril came and gave me this good news. He said, Ya Messenger of Allah, I have good news for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has promised that he will send peace upon anyone who sends peace upon you. And Allah Sala said he will send blessings upon anyone who sends blessings upon you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yasullunu ala nabi ya ayyuh lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Indeed, Allah and his angels send peace and blessings upon Rasulullah. And those of us who believe, we are supposed to do the same thing. And this hadith so beautifully articulates what a great deal it is. This is one of the best deals that is out there. You will send salam in the name of Rasulullah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends salam in your name. You send blessings and salawat in the name of Rasulullah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends salawat in your name. And you know what? This is a deal in which there is no cost to us. We would do this anyway because we love our Nabi. Even in this hadith, I, I, I learned about this very recently, maybe a year or two ago. Before that, I didn't know about this tradition. But we did this. Some of us habitually, some of us consciously. Some of us do it habitually because we've grown up as children in Muslim communities. Some of us who are recent converts develop this. And this is an indication of our love for our dear Prophet. So, so I want to start today's discussion with this good news that this is a beautiful deal. Every time you think of the Prophet every time you hear his name, every time you have some time you're driving, just send peace and blessings upon him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send peace and blessings upon you. You must also understand that the quality of peace and blessings that come to us from Allah are infinitely superior and beautiful than what we can ever send His way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in His Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ إِمَّا رَبِّي فَهِمٌ وَدُودٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and ask forgiveness of your Lord and then repent to Him. Tawbah means repentance. Tawbah can also mean to turn back towards Allah, coming back towards Him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, seek forgiveness from your Lord and then repent to Him. And because of, and why do we do that? Because Allah is most merciful and loving. Al-Wudud. Allah is Al-Wudud. Inna Rabbi Rahim Wudud. We have talked about many different attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, we find at least 99 sifat. One of them is al-wudud, which means Allah is a lover. He loves. We live in a time where for some reason, which I'll 
too complicated, too historical for me to be able to explain to you. But in the last couple of hundred years, Muslims have become obsessed with law to such an extent that we only think that the fuqaha are ulama. So we have equated ilm with fiqh, fuqaha with ulama, and to a great extent, we use the word Islam and the word Sharia interchangeably. So being a good Muslim is often understood as being Sharia compliant. In fact, the word has become Sharia compliant. We talk of Islamic economics, we talk of even countries, are they Sharia compliant or not? But what has happened, the price of being obsessed with law is that we have forgotten about love. Allah is Hakim indeed, but he's also Wudu. So we must not forget that Islam is also about love. It is about law, but it is also about love. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to speak about himself in the Quran. He describes himself as the most benevolent and most merciful. He's not constantly referring to his qualities as a judge. But he is constantly referring to his <coughs> qualities as merciful and compassionate. According to our Hadith of Fussi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he created this universe, wrote a note to himself in which he said that, let my mercy prevail over my anger. Rahma will be ghalib over his ghadab. Mercy, the feeling of mercy, is an expression of love. Love is a subset of compassion. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he is Rahim and Rahman, he is also saying he is Wudud. And he says that many times. Actually, even though only 113 surahs start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, except Surah Tawbah, but there is in the Quran 114 times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to begin in the name of Allah who is most compassionate and most merciful. We, we live in, an, in a very strange environment today where everything that Muslims do, everything that is about Islam is analyzed, is overanalyzed, not just by non-Muslims, but also by Muslims. As we live in this world, we don't know what our children are learning about our religion, what they are reading on the internet, in their textbooks, in their schools, in their colleges. So there seems to be a tremendous war of ideas going on there, which is trying to paint Islam as either a religion that is intolerant, a religion that is barbaric, or a religion that is crude and tough. And we are also struggling to prove the opposite, that this is the religion of the most merciful and most compassionate. Who is most important entity when we talk about faith? It is God. And God is most merciful and most compassionate. And after God, who do we talk about? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who is he? He is he who was sent as mercy to all of humanity. So, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to the Quran? Quran is a rahmah that has been revealed to us. So you could use the term Rahma to describe God, to <coughs> describe his messenger, to describe his message. So this message, God of compassion and love and mercy, who sent a messenger who is a messenger to everything, that ayah is fascinating. It is not just to all of humanity, that is a, a poetic translation, it is to all the worlds. Alami to all the worlds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet sallam, as compassion to all the worlds, to animals, to kingdom, to the environment, to the space. We can't abuse the environment. When I was young, I used to stomp my food down, I think, when I used to cry. I remember my grandmother telling me, don't ever stomp on the earth, young man, because on the day of judgment, the earth might testify against you that you are arrogant and cruel. It really scared me. It really scared me. I still remember it. I must have been three when my grandmother told me. And I, so I was quite afraid of nature. So even when I was alone, I don't do things. Maybe my car will testify where I'm going. 
Maybe my computer will testify against me on the day of judgment. So I used to fear like that. But there is more to Islam than law and fearing. Yes, indeed, we have to be muttaqeen, but we are also those who are muhsini. And I think that we are living in an environment where we have overemphasized one aspect of the deen and overlook other aspects of the deen. And this imbalance is what we are seeing, which is causing a lot of chaos in the Muslim world. We want our children to grow up loving God, loving their prophet, loving their message, and loving their humanity. One day, Prophet ﷺ was talking to a person who, was, who had some very serious business with him, and he stopped to comfort a child. And that person had to leave town early, so he was in a hurry, and so he was trying to suggest to the Prophet that, forget about the child, let's finish our business. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to him very angrily, and Rasulullah did not get angry off. And he said, he who does not show mercy to humanity, Allah will not show mercy to him. So this great mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes with a caveat. We have to show mercy to others. And that is very important. An Andalusian uh, scholar, philosopher, and poet actually described Islam as the religion of love. I wish I could recite the poem to you in Arabic. I can't. But in English it says, I profess the religion of love. Wherever it is caravan turns along the way, that is the belief, the faith I keep. So it is very interesting. He equates Iman with Mahabba. Now you might say, how can that be? Because we know what is Iman. Iman is to believe in the th six things that are there in the Hadith of Jibreel. But there are many traditions, especially in which Rasulullah says, your faith is not complete until you love for your brothers what you love for yourself. It is this love of humanity which completes your deen, your iman. So your iman is incomplete if you have not felt love for others. And the way you felt love for others is by desiring for others what you desire for yourself. Now there are some people who define this in the, in the hadith, the word is brother. Your faith is incomplete if you do not desire for your brother what you desire for yourself. Now a lot of American Muslim scholars and imams are describing the word brother as humanity. So at first I, I was cynical when I heard it. I thought that maybe for media attention and political correctness, we are expanding the concept of love. But when I went back and looked at classical scholars, even 1,200 years ago, Muslim scholars who were writing commentaries on this hadith implied that the word brother in this implies the whole universe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ was very clear when he said that if you do not desire for others what you desire for yourself, if you do not love for others what you love for yourself, your faith is incomplete. God's love, there are, there are four ways in which we can think of love in an Islamic context. If you look at scholars in the Muslim world, they have divided it into metaphorical love and true love. Those of you who are familiar with either Arabic, Persian, or even Urdu poetry, you know the words ishq majazi and ishq haqiqi. Love which is metaphorical and love which is real. Love, which is metaphorical, is the love of things that are created. So even if you love your children, if you love your job, if you love your country, these are all metaphorical loves. They are not real. The only true real love is your love for God. The only true love, that's why we say ishq haqiqi, the only true love is for God. The philosophy behind this principle is very complex. It emerges from the notion that we are all transient, which means that by definition we will all cease to exist. It is only God that has always existed, will always exist. So only he possesses reality. Only he possesses haqiqah, reality, and therefore true love can only be love of God. Now this is very common, it's, it's, it's part of Muslim tradition. That is why you find something very fascinating today that for the last 15 years, I think, Rumi the poet is the best selling poet in the world. He outsells Shakespeare five is to one. 
for every book of Shakespeare that is bought, five books of Rumi are bought in the US. And the reason why he is so popular is because the world today is thirsting for love. It is thirsting for true love. And in the words of Rumi, in his poetry, they find some semblance, some direction, some meaning of what this true love is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in an ayah in the Quran, which I had read many times before but never noticed this until I started reading about love and Islam and I found that scholars have written books on just this one little phrase in the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu man yartadda minkum an deenihi fa sawfa yati allahu bi khawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibboonahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his holy book Allah will bring a people whom he will love and they will love him yuhibbuhum wa yuhibboonahu Now this little phrase, just these two words in Arabic Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring a people whom he will love and who will love him. Has exploded. There are very few religious texts which actually talk so clearly about love of Allah. There are three things that we can draw from this phrase. One, number one is he loved first. It is Allah who loved first. He loved them and then they loved him. So Allah loves us first and then we love him. That's why he has phrased it, Yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbunahum. They love, he loved them and they loved him. The second thing and the most beautiful part of it is that it describes the relationship between God and his servant, which is a relationship of mutual love. This is a relationship of mutual love. He loves us and we love him. If he doesn't love us and we don't love him, then we are not from among those who he has brought to replace those who turned against him. So either we belong to that group that turned against him, or we belong to that group whom he loves and we love him. So if we want to be part of that group that he loves, we have to love him. It is very important for us to understand this. It is in the Quran, but it hasn't received the same attention that other things receive. It is like saying that you go to a buffet. There is a huge buffet in front of you. There is delicacies and sweets and all kinds of things, and all you do is eat roti and kebab and walk away. You don't have a dry taste in your mouth and you would have missed all the sweets. So when Muslims approach their sources, the Quran and the Hadith, it is like a huge buffet. It's impossible for any one of us to fully comprehend our deen, to fully understand the Quran. It's impossible. Sometimes I think it is impossible to even understand the meaning of one verse in your entire life. So it is like a buffet that never ends. But fortunate of us are those who also get to taste the sweets. And I, that is what I want you to do today. I want you to taste the sweetness that is there in our deen and that sweetest part of the deen is love. Uh, we expect the mosque to have a larger crowd today because of the fact that a lot of people are not going to work at school. So I would recommend that you start using spaces which are available so that more and more brothers can come in in the back. I've already talked to you about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described himself as al budu but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has many verses in which he talks about two things. Those whom he loves and those whom he does not love. We can actually do a khutbah on each one of those ayat, but let me summarize for you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he loves those who do exam, those who are mercenary, who do beautiful things. Allah loves those who are constantly repentant, which means you are constantly seeking tawbah. Those who are constantly seeking tawbah, Allah loves them. Those who are muttaqeen, who are God conscious, who are constantly aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loves them. Those who are mustaqeen, who are steadfast, those who are sabirin, who are patient, Allah loves them to rely on Him. 
who believe in tawakkul Allah, who believe in Allah and rely on Allah, Allah loves them. And Allah loves them who act justly. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also told us whom he does not love. <coughs> Allah does not love those who exceed their limits, mu'tadeen, who instigate turmoil and chaos. He does not love the mufsidun who do fisad on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially does not like those who are ungrateful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love those who are zalimun and those who are boastful, those who are treacherous, those who lie. And those who express joy excessively, Allah does not love them. Sometimes I feel that the second list describes me better than the first list. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make us look more and more like the first list, belonging to the list of the characteristic that Allah loves and devoid of the characteristics that Allah does not love. There are two important traditions that you must know. One is the Hadith of Qudsi. Hadith of Qudsi is a Hadith in which Prophet ﷺ says, Allah said. So these are the words paraphrased. They may not be the Quran, but they are like Quran because these are the words of Allah. The Messenger of Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever shows enmity towards my friend, towards my wali, I have declared war against him. And who is this wali? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and my servant comes near to me with everything more love to me. So if you perform all the duties that Allah has commanded to you, fast, pray, etc., you go nearer to him. But my servant draws even more nearer to me when he does the nawafil. When you do the nawafil, you go more closer to him until I love him. So in many ways, the way to can gain Allah's love is to performing nawafil prayers, to, to go over and above what is required. That is very important. So every time you get a chance to do something which is not fault, do it. Because that is where the love affair with Allah begins. When I love him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when I love my wali, my friend, I am his hearing with which he hears. I am his sight with which he sees and his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks. Were he to ask me, I would surely give him whatever he wants. And were he to seek refuge with me, I would surely grant him his refuge. In another tradition, the Prophet ﷺ says, when Allah loves his servant, he calls Jibreel and says, O oh Jibreel, I love so and so. You should also love him. And then Jibreel begins to love that person because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that person. And then Jibreel makes an announcement in the heaven saying, Allah loves so and so, you also should love him. Then all the inhabitants of the heaven, all the angels, also begin to love him. And there is conferred honor upon him on this earth. Now what is interesting is that if you love God and you have done enough service to have earned his love, it's not just that Allah loves you back, it is the entire cosmos that loves you back, the entire spiritual world that loves you back. I hope that, that, that we learn from these sources that I have shared with you, the struggle to be a good Muslim, but also to be a good servant of Allah. And the best servant of Allah is one who is in love with Allah and whom Allah loves. <laughs> Prophet says, By him in whose hands my life is, none of you will have faith till he loves me more than his father, his children, and all of humanity. So as a, as a believer, we have these three dimensions of love. One is love for Allah. The other is love for his prophet. And the third is love for humanity. And this is very important because when the Prophet says that your faith is incomplete, your faith is incomplete until you love me more than your father, your family, and everything else. Now this, this hadith, to me, links the connection between Iman and love. 
So there are two of these where the Prophet said, yeah. the man is incomplete if you do not love for your brother what you love for yourself. If you do not desire for your brother what you desire for yourself. And the other one is your faith is incomplete if you do not love the Prophet more than everything else. So in many ways, when we work on our faith and we try to become better believers and better Muslims, you have to understand that it is not just about law, it is also about love. And don't forget that aspect of love. Uh, there is a poet called Sheikh Saadi, a Persian poet, who took a verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, serve Allah and not join any partners with him, and do ihsan to your parents, to your kinfolks, to orphans, those in need, do ihsan to neighbors who are near, and neighbors who are strangers. Do ihsan to the companion by your side. Do ihsan to the travelers. And do ihsan to all those who you are responsible for. For Allah does not love the arrogant and the boastful. This is a very, very beautiful ayah in the Quran. It is number 36 uh, in Surah Nisa. But this poet, Sheikh Sali, I think inspired by this ayah of the Quran, wrote a very beautiful poem, which he says, all men and women are to each other the limbs of a single body, each of us drawn from life's shimmering essence, God's perfect pearl. And when this life we share wounds one of us, all share the hurt as if it were our own. You, will, you who will not feel another's pain, you forfeit the right to be called human. It's a, it's a very profound line. He says that if you do not feel the pain of those who suffer, you give up the claim to be a human being. The humanity is not just using your aql. Humanity is to be able to feel love, to be able to feel compassion, to be able to empathize and sympathize with others who are in pain. There's a separate hadith which says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly loves those hearts which are broken. When a heart is broken, Allah is, loves that heart. And if you cannot feel for that heart, you have compromised and abdicated your humanity. And what is beautiful about this ayah is if you go to the United Nations building and you enter the main hall of the building at the United Nations in New York, this is the slogan that you will see on the wall written very profoundly. One of the models of the United Nations is this. You who will not feel another Spain, you forfeit the right to be called human. I'm running out of time, so I will skip a few things, but I do want to share something with you. That there are three dimensions. When Prophet Isa was asked about the Ten Commandments, and you know what the Ten Commandments are, he summarized the Ten Commandments in one line. He says, the essence of these Ten Commandments are love of God and love of your neighbor. Simple as that to love God and to love your neighbor. And the Quran says, love your neighbor who is close to you and love your neighbor who is stranger to you. God made sure that Muslims got it. He just then said, just don't love your community members, people from your country or your tribe, etc. Love those who are strangers to you, which means they are not your kin, that they are not your kith and kin. They are your neighbors, but especially for American Muslims who live in extremely diverse societies, this ayah is very powerful, 436. Love those who are your neighbors, and love those neighbors who are strangers to you. One day, the Prophet ﷺ was asked by Aisha, who is my neighbor? It was a very beautiful question, the way she phrased it. It was like a philosophical question. He says, the door nearest to our door. That's it. Our neighbor is one whose door is nearest to our door. He didn't say that they have to be Muslims, they have to be from our country or our tribe. So those of us who live here, we, we must understand that our <coughs> man is in, incomplete. Our faith is in incomplete if we do not feel this love towards everybody else. I want to conclude by a part of a hadith narrated by Abu Dhar. It is part of Sahih Muslim. It is very important as we talk about love of Allah to understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh my servants, were well, the first of you and the last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, to be as pious as the most pious heart <coughs> of any one man, it would not increase my kingdom in anything. 
This is a very incredible statement. Allah is saying that if all of humanity and if all of the jinns combined together were as pious as the most pious heart. Can you imagine who is the most pious heart? And Allah is saying that if all of you were as pious as that part, you add nothing to my kingdom. Just nothing to my kingdom. And he says, oh my servants, were the first of you and last of you, the human of you and the jinn of you, to be as wicked as the wickedest heart of any one man, you would not decrease my kingdom in anything. So if he says, if all of human beings and all of jinns were as evil as the worst of us, he would take nothing away from him. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is this, we can give him nothing, we can take nothing away from him. He's, he's putting us in our place by telling us the enormously diminished status that we have towards him, how great he is and how insignificant we are and it is in spite of this insignificance that he loves us we are nothing we are just nothing he created us and he created cockroaches too and he can create us as he creates other things we are just nothing to him yet he loves us if that is not a reason to love him I can't think of another reason to love him I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He inspires in our hearts love for Allah, love for His Messenger, love for the rest of the humanity. In the absence of this love in our hearts, we must at least believe that we have foregone or lost the capacity to be a human being. A human being is one who loves, a Muslim is one who loves, and Allah Himself is lover al wadud. ربنا أعطينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة وحسنة وقنا عذاب النار بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمر بالأذل والإحسان وإيتاء القربة وينهى من الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يذكر من لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة